My name is Sam Bagni. I'm the author of Malignant Self-Love, Narcissism Revisited. It is this time of year when I dust off my crystal ball and gaze into its depth fondly. Ten predictions for the coming decade, starting with political assassinations. The job, or possibly life, of any pope attempting to truly reform the Vatican is in jeopardy. The top echelons of the Catholic Church are in a deep crisis, faced with a reputation tattered by decades of unrelenting, egregious scandals, an ossified, ossified corporate culture, interpersonal relationships strained to the breaking point, and dwindling finances. The next few years will witness a titanic battle over the soul of this dysfunctional, secretive, and criminalized organization. A lot of money and power are at stake. People have been assassinated for less. In general, the next decade will see a resurgence of political assassinations. Obama's policies lately on Cuba, remember Kennedy, put him at a growing risk. ISIL, the Islamic State, may target one or more leaders of the European Union. An enraged and frustrated Palestinian may do away with an Israeli politician. The list of targets is long and growing by the day. Back to safer ground. The Euro. On November 24th, 2010, I published an article titled Italy Will Kill the Euro. Six months later, credit rating agencies have downgraded Italy's outlook from stable to negative. Italy has never really recovered. It has endured another downgrade in December 2014. Like Greece, it is in worse, worse shape than most members of the European Union. At 3% of GDP, it has an ostensibly sustainable budget deficit, but its external debt, now close to 170% of GDP, is higher in constant dollars than that of the most egregious wastrels in the bloc, Greece and Ireland included. Italy's banking sector is overexposed to borrowers in Central and Eastern Europe, a region habitually pendulating between recovery and economic calamity. If Italy goes Greece's and Ireland's way, the EU and the International Monetary Fund, already overextended by serial bailouts and with Greece on the brink of a second crisis, will be unable to stem the red tide. Italy may actually effectively default and in the process ruin the euro and restore the US dollar to its, to its erstwhile glory. Zoom away to Korea. By late 2010, a succession war was simmering in North Korea. His panoply of suddenly bestowed senior political and military posts notwithstanding, the generals and military establishment are less than happy and impressed with Kim Jong-un, the younger son of the dear leader Kim Jong-il. Each side in this battle flexes muscles in an attempt to burnish their national and nationalistic and martial credentials. The outcomes of this internecine conflict are ominous, a series of ever-escalating military skirmishes with South Korea and the ramping up of North Korea's already bargaining nuclear weapons and cyber war programs, as Sony discovered, to its cost. North Korea's leaders are likely to try to reform their country's economy and introduce capitalism, but it will fail. The regime in North Korea is all but dead on its feet. These are its last days. China is facing the terrifying spectacle of a chronic failed state with tens of millions of starved and destitute potential refugees swarming across its porous and indefensible borders. China's ascendance to superpowerdom and its respectability are threatened by this association with the last remaining pariah rogue state. There is only one solution to all the problems of the Korean Peninsula, unification. The parties came close to discussing it in secret talks in 2002 and then again in 2009. It's only a matter of time. And apropos China, as I predicted in an article published in February, on February 22, 2009, entitled The Next 18 Months, Recession, Post Recovery and Depression, well, as I predicted in that long-winded article, the years 2010-2011 witnessed a recovery from the Great Recession of 2008-2009.
mounting sovereign debts, uh, precipitated crisis in Europe, and an anemic rebound in America's economy. But these were more than outweighed by the emergence of Asia as a global powerhouse. And yet the warning signs were there. China's economic miracle was based on unsustainable dollops of government's la government largesse and monetary quantitative easing. This led to the formation of asset, asset bubbles, mainly in real estate. It also led to pernicious inflation. The Chinese authorities' attempts to clamp down on rampant speculation and price gouging are too late and too little. The economy will slow down considerably, and the Chinese house of cards will collapse ominously and swiftly. This will bring the entire global economic edifice into disarray with mounting imbalances and increased risk aversion among investors. The second phase of the global crisis will resemble closely the Great Depression, with massive write-offs in the values of equities and mounting two-digit unemployment rates almost everywhere. What about Israel and the Middle East? The Arab Spring of 2011 empowered Islamist and other anti-Israeli elements in Arab society. Israel and its allies, the reactionary Arab regimes, were long and justly perceived by the oppressed average Arab as outposts of American and previously British mercantilist neo-imperialism. The popular uprisings unseated these entrenched dictatorial elites and replaced them with military and Muslim ruling classes bent on restoring the anti-Israeli hostility and enmity that characterized the Middle East before 1979. Phenomena like Sharia toting ISIL, Islamic State, have become the mainstream norm rather than the exception in large parts of Yemen, Syria, Lebanon, Iraq, Afghanistan, Pakistan, Turkey, and even India. In time, this and heavy Iranian meddling will lead to an all-out war between Israel and its neighbors, the outcome of which cannot be predicted with any certainty. On to another uh, rock state. In, uh, 2000, in, on June 2nd, 2010, I published an article titled Putin's Last Days. That was a long time ago, and I may have jumped the gun. But Putin is on his way out. The belligerent stance in Ukraine, and the massive economic crisis that followed, the West sanctions, and the collapse in oil prices, amount to Putin's own personal Vietnam. With this clownish strongman gun, Russia is bound to become a far more liberal and democratic place. No matter who wins the next presidential elections or not, Russia's oligarchs are a dying breed. The rule of law is asserting itself. Property rights will be restored. A new cadre of politicians, young, educated, self-confident and cosmopolitan, though not necessarily pro-Western, will take Russia forward and free it from pecuniary dependence on oil. They will diversify its economy. This is the real world. What about the more important cyber world? In 2010, the Stuxnet war delivered a paralyzing payload to Iran's nuclear centrifuges, thus heralding the second salvo in a gathering storm of cyber wars. Yes, the second salvo. A Turkish pipeline was the first to have been attacked in 2008. Prior to Stuxnet, hacker networks, both government-mandated and self-assembling, attack the internet infrastructure of perceived enemies, prime examples being Russian attacks on the Baltic states and on Georgia, and Chinese attacks on dissidents' accounts with Gmail and Google. The resulting disruption was minimal, and it was transient, but not so with Stuxnet. Stuxnet ruined the Iranian the Iranian uranium enrichment infrastructure single-handedly and remotely and without a single casualty among the Israelis who had launched it. Similar offensives will become common in, common in the near future. State actors will also unleash guerrilla cyber skirmishes via hacker teams and proxy computers. The best example is, of course, North Korea's humbling of Sony in December 2014. On to international institutions. Composition of and voting rights in the United Nations and its organs, including the World Bank, 
as well as other multilateral institutions such as the International Monetary Fund, the IMF. Well, the composition and voting rights reflect the world as it had been in 1946, after the Second World War. A lot has changed since then, most notably the emergence of Asia as the fastest growing region, both economically and militarily, and also the relative decline of an insular Europe and a depleted United States. Within the next few years, the upper echelons of the IMF and the UN will be revamped to reflect the gargantuan historic shifts. We will see Asians and Africans running the world. And apropos running the world, snubbed by the European Union and the United States alike, Turkey is reorienting itself. Once again it is playing the role of a regional potentate, with its ties to regimes of all sorts, veteran and unsavory, emerging and fundamentalist, conservative and not so, terrorism prone and peace seeking. Turkey's military and its secular political establishment have lost the decades-old grip on power. Moderate Islam, so-called, reified by Turkey's Prime Minister Erdogan, is slowly being transformed into an authoritarian, fundamentalist, anti-Western pay limitation of Pakistan and Iran. Its erstwhile warm relationships with Israel is of course free. It surreptitiously supports terrorist organizations like ISIL, Islamic State, against Syria's Assad. Media freedoms and online access are curtailed and censored. Human rights are again breached and violated blatantly, especially where Kurds, intellectuals and journalists are concerned. Turkey's role in NATO, its special relationship with the USA and its EU accessories, uh, EU accession, are all in doubt and from one Muslim country to another. The second war between the United States and China, directly and via proxies, will be fought on Pakistani, Indian and Afghani soil. As an increasingly Islamized Pakistan veers away from its frenemy, the United States, and towards its newfound ally, China, America's vital interests in Afghanistan, India, Japan and South Korea are at stake. Skirmishes will evolve into full-fledged conflict with a slate of nuclear powers as adversaries, Pakistan, India, China, Russia, who will back China, and the United States within NATO. So what can I say? Happy New Decade.